Hello, everyone. Uh, so today, uh, we've been kind of tossing around the idea. Last year, we went through and we did uh, quite a few episodes of uh, contingency, exploration through that, a little bit of uh, world building design, character uh, design, adventure design, uh, mapping, uh, lore, a, a ton of stuff. A big, a big chunk of an overview. Just some basic foundational tools uh, that you can use within tabletop RPG, uh, tabletop RPG and design. You can use it for um, world building, uh, you can use them for story development, things like that. So today, I was going to go into uh, a little more of the conversation about tabletop RPG design in general and what foundationally is tabletop RPG. Now, there's a lot of ways to look at tabletop RPG and RPG as uh, a general concept, but each aspect uh, that you take a look at has its own weight and value in the design process. So how you look at that space plays a huge role in how conversations about that space take place and about how the design is going to then take, take shape, take place, uh, and be, I guess, distributed if you're going to take a look at it from a professional aspect. So for me, uh, with the design of contingency system, because I've been running contingency for over 30 years, so my outlook on the space, which is how I look at it, is a lot different, and I would say a lot more critical um, in terms of the aspects that are the different components, the conversation, everything. It has a huge, a huge amount of variables. So there isn't one space. There is multiple spaces. And, and the understanding that that exists and that will continue to exist is important. I think a lot of times that a developer is thinking about branding in general, uh, like Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, Green Ronin, whatever, right? Each aspect uh, of their brand, they want to shine through. And sometimes in that process, they can actually be counterproductive. Uh, for me, there are certain additions and certain brands that I do not use because they're too counterproductive or they create an environment that, for me, is not welcoming to the space in general. So by welcoming, I mean that the space has become too restrictive of itself and not inclusive of the rest of the space. Now, that could be within their own brand, which happens often, or with other brands that exist. And it isn't a matter of like, you need to design your game so that all the other games can be used with it. I've done that with the contingency system. Um, it can be used with anything. It can be used by itself, completely standalone, or it can be used as a supportive tool within any space to help correct it, make decisions, make repairs, correct issues, whatever, whatever the case may be. But that is by my design. I don't expect them to design like that, uh, but they should. A designer should take a look at what it is that they're doing and not create more problems than solutions within their own space, right? The idea is to create something that can be used and in the publication process, it's going to be used in multiple places, multiple spaces. So either you take the time to figure out the communication within your own space so that that's perfect, right? That you are instructing properly 
what it is that you would like to have occur, and then also get into the um, space more critical and say, what if this is used in this format? And, and think about think about the space in its entirety. Will this be used with other formats? It's possible. Will it not be used with other formats? Very possible. Will it be used with other components within our own brand? I hope so, because that's why you develop your own brand. And, and the idea, besides just looking at it in that critical aspect, is, is even more foundational to, to a theoretical, more analytical approach, which is the way the contingency system operates. It's the way that I operate. It's the way that I do uh, instruction, because for me, management level, that's what I do. Operational compliance is the thing. You know, there are so many components that are, are factors that people don't tend to think about. They pick up a book and they say, okay, I've got it. And they may sit down and glance through it and grab some details from it and they're ready to go. And what they might not understand is perhaps the designer did not build it that way. That you can go in and extract that like that and still run it without issue. Sometimes there are components within the design of a game that a designer requires in order for other components to work properly. And that if a person playing it then runs into an issue and says, well, the designer just didn't do this properly. And then the designer will come back and say, well, you missed the other components of this design that are crucial for that component to work. Oh, well, I should just be able to. Well, that's not how we designed it. And they may get back and forth and upset. The other thing is a designer may lose focus of what the design is about. You know, what are you designing it for? Who are you designing it for? Where is it to be used? And these are some of the things that we're going to take a look at today. So hopefully this works. Um, I was going to use it in more of a slideshow format, but I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like the way that technology has sort of advanced in that aspect. It doesn't give me, you know, because I'm kind of greedy. <laughs> I want it to do what I want it to do, and if it doesn't do that, then I'm not going to use it. I'm better off on my own, and I can design it myself. So I built it a little different. Um, it's in here, I, and I'm going to scroll through it, and I, I find that that's probably going to be a little better, because the slideshow format, I didn't like the screen transitions, and I've been using a computer since they were available to the public, so the programs now don't provide me with my level of what I require enough, so I'm not using them right now. <laughs> Because I'm not going to pay for one uh, just to do presentations. This will work just fine. So the idea is to go through this, and it's not incredibly long. And the amount of detail and in the information that's in here is going to give you sort of like, a, I guess, a perspective on contingencies approach, my approach, uh, to looking at design for tabletop RPG and what is tabletop RPG in general? Because for me, I think a tool, which is what it is, uh, you can beat it around, you know, talk about it, discuss it, argue it, however you wish. But it is a tool. It is something that you are doing to inspire something else. You're providing an, an aspect to create from, right? A adventure module or a book about a world is there to inspire the imagination in someone else. Now, whether or not it's through instruction and they're getting a good takeaway from that, or it's inspiration only, or maybe it's just step-by-step, -step, like a cookbook, which a lot of times a D&D &D module uh, can be. Right, a Dungeons and Dragons module can be very cookbooky. Right, do this for this, do that for this, and you got a framework to operate in. 
And then a lot of people would be like, well, I played that module. And then another person's like, well, I played that module. And I'm like, well, you didn't do that, this, and that. And then you can get into the tangents. Well, it's a framework, right? So, and it's used in a system that they don't know exists. And for me, you know, if I worked at Wizards of the Coast, I would have to go through the process of instructing them of the things that they have missed. Because, you know, it's it's too bad that people like Gary aren't here, you know, and, and they can talk bad about them all that they want. And you got the both sides of the conversation and, and the toxic level of the new age player. But in reality, there is foundational thought there. Okay, because there was a design and the design was then expanded and extracted and then expanded yet again. And moreover, and there was a system that was designed within it and Dungeons and Dragons has it, uh, but they're not using it right now. Fifth edition is not using the design aspect of Dungeons and Dragons, right? And it can be argued, uh, but the fact exists. It has a system within it that Gary developed in order to protect it itself in its design, in its integrity of design, to keep the system flowing in forward direction, with or without him. Removing those components, which they have done uh, quite extensively, like with 5th edition, has been detrimental. And they've found that out. I mean, they've seen it, you know. And uh, in my mind, their hiring process, <laughs> you know, and the way that they go through the staff, they figure, oh, that didn't do well. It must be their fault. No, <laughs> you're using a repetitive design that you've you've run through a, a, a grinder and removed what its foundational components are and, and moved forward in the design itself with a self detrimenting parameter that they've turned toxic upon itself. You know, like a simple concept of specific beats general has been misconstrued within their system. And then they have converted the audience and the participants within that space to follow that toxic design. And it's self-detrimental because they don't understand what specific beats general means. And that's just a very core mechanic of Dungeons and Dragons. And it's sort of like layman's terms. If you specify something that's general, it doesn't make it any less general. It's constantly supporting that general concept. It exists within the specification. Otherwise, it's just a new general concept. So if you're replacing something generalized with something specific, it doesn't mean that the generalization is gone. And they do that often. They eliminate the generalization and make the specific take place which then makes it a general concept again. And that's the rule that Gary always said. Specific beats general. If you go in and you specify something and replace it with the specific without supporting the general concept, then you have failed. And you must go back to the beginning and redo it because it's incorrect. It's a self-checking system. I call it Gygaxian 3. Specific beats general, right? And it's a very simple process, but it's throughout the entirety. And you can always tell when there's something that he touched specifically, because you can see it in the design. And that isn't the only time that that pops up. So, that being said, contingency has some systems of its own in place. So, in my mind, you know, you always ask the question, what is a tabletop RPG? And the conversation, it, it, it goes everywhere. So, we're going to focus it down a bit. So... Tabletop RPG, is it a physical space, a social space, or a creative space, right? And the answer is quite simple, and it is also complex at the same time. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. We're going to get a better understanding of what this thing is all about. And as always, when we use the contingency system, it's a guide. To help build a better foundation from which to expand the conversation logically and help those interested in creating a better space private public or professionally period so we're going to begin and i'm going to begin in a way and we're going to 
take the steps in a way that doesn't leave anyone in the conversation. It's a forward thinking conversation. And it's foundation that I use for the contingency system because in my mind, the way that a design must be is forward thinking. Because if it is not forward thinking, it's starting to create a sort of like anchor that drags the design back and retracts its forward progress can actually be so detrimental to a design that the design is a failure or that the design itself becomes so self-destructive that it will undo itself. That it will create more problems than solutions within its framework and it will not function properly. I've seen it happen, right? I'm sure other people have seen it happen when they're playing a game and they're like, well, what if this or this has occurred now what? And then they're like, but now there's no answer. <laughs> when they look for it within the system, they find if they look, you know, analytically at it, that the system itself created this problem. And then there is no solution there. Unless the developer takes the time to do an update like you do with uh, video games in a digital space. Or if, let's say, it's a book and somebody that's writing the book creates a loophole within there and they're like, oh, well, this is a problem. We call that a cliffhanger. <laughs> in a game that may or may not function properly, mechanical games especially, that can create a problem. And on this channel, a lot of times we run into that when we're playing a game, we find a mechanical issue within the coding or the operations of the game itself we do voice our opinion upon them because it should be looked at especially if it's one that's foundational like as an example i play a game called arc right arc survival evolved and simple thing within the aspect of the game they had put a a village there's a village in there, they design walls on it, some loose structures in there. And how Ark always works is there was a civilization that existed before you in that space. And your character is trying to reclaim the space back, discover what was lost, and sort of put it back so it's ready to accept more than just your character in that space. Okay? So... The problem is, is in that minute detail of design, they didn't take the time to think, well, obviously this is not fortified in its completion. So really to make the design that they've put here around this village more effective, somebody's going to have to put some gates up so that the dinosaurs can't make their way into the village, right? To protect it. Because there's massive openings, obviously, entrance and exits for the village itself. But they didn't line the walls up 100%. And they didn't take the time to consider what components are used within the game and have been used within the game since day one, which has been a long span of time. So a person coming in there and wants to do it and says, hey, okay, I want to put these in. Well, this doesn't work. That doesn't fit. Now what am I going to do? I can't fit that into that space. So they have to take a look at it creatively. And then by the time they're done looking at it, they're like, well, I can't use what they have here. I have to do something different, of which I have done within my uh, my own set of my stream uh, when I live stream it, because I live stream the game. I put uh, a completely different structure in place, completely undoing what they created because it didn't work. But the designer should have thought about that. They should have took a few seconds and said, okay, we got this village. This is what I want to do with it. Okay, pause. These are the tools available to me as the designer. But what about the tools available once this is passed along to the next person? When the next person has this space, what are they going to be able to do with this? What can they do with this within the constraints of the game? Let's take a look at the components. Let's now alter the design within my vision as the designer 
so that it is more suitable to the person who is going to be using this. The pass along must be as accurate as the design itself. Otherwise, it's just, it's there and then it's of no value, right? Excellent idea, cool space, poor execution, right? Correctable, but again, there are some hangups. There's some sections within there that it's like, wow, this is super difficult here. I got to do something completely different. And on top of that, all right, it's a survival game. So in order to get the resources that you need, you have to venture out a little farther from the village once you do find it to get some of the things that you're going to require. And it's super dangerous because there's a lot of creatures that are a higher level outside of that village. Like they're really hot on the character space. So that's just a single component within the entire expanse of that game that was overlooked. Previous uh, expansion packs for the game had had some other issues of things that they missed. Now, it can happen. Minute detail. We super constructed this. It looks great. But those minute details can have a larger impact on the game. That's why we do foundational design, right? That's why I do foundational design. That's why I deal with compliance. That's why I deal with managerial aspects. Because a person showing up to do work, as an example, if they don't know how to do that job, they have to be instructed to do it. Now, there's going to be some carryover. There's going to be some baseline human intelligence applied to the situation. But you have to think about it beyond that into more critical thinking and the effects of those components and decisions and other aspects within it. And I think that way of having to develop a mindset for that, and not just an individual-based instruction, but multiple individual-based instruction, is part of the things that helped contingency basically survive as long as it has uh, in its format. It's a single format. That's 30 years of gameplay and multiple, multiple people using it multiple people playing in multiple worlds and me running what a normal rpg player or gm would think is absolutely impossible or mind melting because of the amount of things they would have to keep track of but that's the joy of it i designed it to do that so that it's done once and it's done right so that it can do that forever no matter what you just plug it in you can roll it you can prep ahead of time you could not prep ahead of time but it is by design like that purposeful because it's a tool it must be a tool because that's what i need that's what a dm or gm or geo needs we call them geos in the contingency system because they're a game organizer they're not just running a space predetermined by someone else which is like a dungeon master typically it's predetermined by someone else a gm or a general um organizer for an event will run not only their own events but multiple events you know uh ones that are pre-published ones that they purchase from multiple systems they'll do a multitude the dm specifically typically and specifically is running an organized event that's pre-planned ahead of time it's done gm runs one it's either their own design or something else right multitudes they don't just run a single thing. It's a multitude of things. I'm not just this brand. I also do this one, that one, this one, that one. I'm a GM. I'm a generalized manager of the situation. Dungeon Master runs an organized, prepared, pre-prepared event. And that's what they run. It could be redefined however they wish. But that is the context. Of it. DM, specific. GM, multitude, GO which is what we do, is even farther than that. Not only are they running multitudes of events uh, within events, but they're also supervising others doing the same thing as well. Uh, because they can. Because they've been trained to do so. So, what is a tabletop RPG? So I'm going to uh, hop screen so I can kind of move through this a little bit easier. So we got a table, right? No, you got the framework of whatever the design happens to be. Uh, it's there. It's present. 
It's doing its thing. Everyone's around it. They may or may not be participating in its design. It may be pre-designed. They may all be sort of collaborating on the design, or they may all be there to share in the experience of the design, right? So the contingency system, you know, uh, for me, I have uh, the contingency system's core operational foundation. I call it the contingency quick play system. And what it is, is it's a development system that allows people to learn as they're playing the game. There's no pre-work to be done. You set down and start going immediately. And what it'll do is it, it redefines the play space. And it helps you to make decisions. You don't even have to make a character ahead of time. You don't have to do um, any sort of, I have to know what this is, I have to know what that is. Nothing. You sit down. There's a game organizer that has prepared all of the necessaries for the event. And all of the necessaries are is, have a seat. <laughs> Right, and we're going to run this thing, and and here's what we're going to run, and it could be completely random the entire time, and there will be rules and instructions that help them decide what do we want to do here, or what do we want to do here, and that's throughout the course of the entire module. If they're using an organized play module, the organized play modules are wrote in the same fashion. They have right the Gagaxian three method, where there's three typical, based off of the story through multitudes of gameplay, three typical paths in which the adventure normally will go based off of logical decisions and the flow of information that has taken place through success and failure in the entire module thus far. So as the module progresses, as the information is flowed to the characters and the players, a logical flow of information logical flow of responses they're participating in the event they're making some decisions it's not a railroad there isn't a single path there are multiple paths multiple things that can occur there's multiple successes and failures and each of those things in the collective build a more specified event as the event is played through right and it's using you know that gygaxian three method the the three components three tier system right going through so but that isn't the only way. So for me, the contingency system, I utilize a rule called 357. So not only do I use the three-part component, but I also expand it to five and then to seven, and then really the contingency system continues to expand out to 10, which is uh, the more advanced gameplay. Uh, it's even more immersive. There's even more things happening within the world space, but all organized and easy to do. And then it continues on, you know, even farther past that, if necessary. Right. Um, hey, what's up, Banjo? How's it going? Talking about tabletop RPGs. Ah, we're doing. I'm fighting a storm system, lightning storm system outside right now. So I'm on here doing a tabletop RPG presentation. Yeah, yeah. This particular time is a few minutes before I normally get on. Uh, but the last couple days, it's like the weather here has been horrible, so I couldn't really get in and do uh, what I wanted to do. Uh, so I was kind of doing some things off cam because I got to kind of connect to the power to run OBS and everything for the higher quality feeds for the stream. I can use the battery. The computer will handle it, but it does drain it pretty quick. So, Yep, yep, yeah, we're good. Hope you guys are doing good, too. Yeah, we're... Uh, we're trying to fight the heat. I got all the ACs running right now, so. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Hope you and the fam's good, too. I'm doing a, a scroll-through presentation, not a slide slideshow presentation. <laughs> I wasn't happy with any of the available formats. Technology hasn't improved from when I used to use it for that particular aspect, at least, so. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, they grow up fast. The kids here, they, uh, they're eating all the time. And then they grow, and then their clothes don't fit. So, you know, all those different layers that stack up in there. It's the, the nature of the beast, you know. Evolution. <laughs> we eat, we grow. <laughs> That's how it works, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, 
organized play, like how I take a look at it, is I'm anticipating that there is going to be uh, variables. There's going to be things within the system itself that are going to change. And expect them to change. Build it specifically for it to change. Allow it to expand within its space. You know, like an adventure module when you get it, there's going to be a lot of times where it'll feel like you're sort of locked into this having to play. And a person running it, and, and it, to me, I think it's more of a poor design because it can be rearranged better. And that's always what I would do when I would get an adventure module. And I, you know, I loved Dungeons and Dragons. I'd always use D&D uh, for my modules, but it wasn't the aspect of their design that I was using because they didn't agree with it 100%. It didn't flow like it should flow. So I would have to go in and I'd have to uh, remove the chains, right? I would remove the barriers and I would expand where they forgot. I would take a look at things that they didn't answer properly and then within the constraints of the module, answer them using the logical flow of information. So when, the, when I would be done with that, you know, I would take the time to do that. When I would be done with that, I would be able to run that much easier. And I would also be able to run it for multitudes of groups, and everybody would have an amazing play experience. It wasn't just the module. We were restricted to the module's design. It was more of an expansive thing that would allow it to provide to a wider audience. You know, we had a lot of, like, organized play um, through the uh, role-playing system back in the day, but it sort of became, in my mind, competitive. And I didn't think that the space in that nature really took the entirety of being part of a group collaborative operate. So if you have, let's say, typically Dungeons & Dragons 5 adventures, if you push it past that, you're starting to flex on the system itself. You have to make some decisions and some changes because its original design is based on the core five characters, five character classes. It's expecting one of each of the roles within it. It doesn't have to be, but success weighs heavy in your favor if you have that variability by design. Gary liked it that way. That's how he designed it. That's how he wrote it. That level of diversity. There wasn't everybody playing the same thing. And in that time frame, it was because people would change up. They wouldn't only just play this character. They would play a different character, and they would play another character class, and they would play all this different stuff because they wanted to explore the entirety of the space. And there's tons of people playing. You know, they have that layer of, oh, no, there wasn't, and we weren't allowed in this space. I call 100% bullshit on that entire concept because I don't know what space you were playing in. But in the spaces I was playing in, you couldn't keep people away. Everyone wanted to play. And not a single person would turn anyone away. There was just too much. You Give me another DM. Give me another seat for another player. It was expansive. That was what it was for. It was a, a sort of like a thing that you would say, no, no, you can't do that. And it's like, I can't. And then they had to. They had to do it. That level of defiance is what motivated that entire generation of players. They they wanted to defy what they were told not to do, which was ridiculous anyways. You know, the whole concept of don't do this <laughs> is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. But that's because they didn't like an organized space beyond their own. Right. Only their space is allowed to be organized. Right. That entitlement. And that carries over even in today's world, right? It's the world of the past, and today's world is even more layered with that. So when I take a look at it, I take a look at the distinction of the design, right? Who are you taking the role of? What role do you play, right, in the design? Artist, graphic designer, writer, editor, game designer, cartographer, play tester, character, world builder, DMGM, organizer. There's a ton. There's not just one or the other. There's a multitude of roles that can be taken. Each are distinctively different and ultimately operate within a boundary for a specific component of the game, its space, and its participants. 
known information and unknown information and undecided and random components must all flow specifically and consistently to create an organized construct or space where clarity and a clear mode of operation exists, even in randomized spaces. Whether it's with dice-driven mechanics, success-fail progressions, varied players, varied DMs, GMs, GOs, even adventure modules and campaigns are going to vary. Space of play, location types, or any other. It's an expansive space, right? Oop, oh, hold on. My navigation screen popped up. So, a defined space, right? So, a space defined. A space defined prior to gameplay, self-designed, purchased, co-created. Right? Those are the three aspects. If you design the game prior to gameplay, you're either designing it yourself, purchasing it, or co-creating it with someone else. Or, a space defined during gameplay, through random events and outcomes, success and fail, or story development points that continue to push the design forward. Operation within a space with some level of determined consistency is the entirety of it, right? Things will happen within that space that require some level of decision-making process, some level of action, and some level of reaction, right? The three components. Because I like using Gygaxian 3, right? So, a progress to some varied degree will happen within that space by advancement of real or imagined time. Operational, perhaps, by mechanics, or structured for play development with success fail, sequence stories, conclusion of events, or the start of new ones. Progress will vary from table to table, system to system, but a defined mode of progress will exist, specifically and purposefully by design or not. Progress will begin and eventually end, and there will be a span of time that exists between those two points, which, in the contingency system, we call general progress. More specifically, defined progress houses those things mentioned previously, either by loose design or rigidity. So, a space defined foundationally in which to design more detail to further improve upon the immersion into the space, supporting more than just the space, but every component within and around it. And that goes for things that could be any possible combination, right? You have to think about the entirety, whether it's a video game, a novel, movie, tabletop game, all of the components. If you forget a component, it's going to show. If you think about one component and don't think about another, you're starting to dial in and tilt the scale of the design within the design. And you might hinder one part and just blow another part out of the water. Oh, that game there is just uh, top of the chain of that particular aspect. But the rest of the game sucked, right? If it could have just done this, and that's where that comes into play. Missing a component or not dialing in properly, you're going to have that effect. So, infinite orchestration, because that's exactly what it is. You know, when you're thinking about the design process of tabletop RPG, it is expansive. It's, pi you know, you can do uh, private, public, professional, you know, and the process is going to begin and continue within each and every space. So if you decide to take, let's say, a tabletop RPG and move it to a digital format, and you want to make a video game with it, you have to at least think about it for a moment and say, okay, who's going to play this, right? We know the what, we know the when, we know the where, right? But who? So if I move this space now into this new one, I can't forget that I have the other one. And that some of that is going to trickle over here. You know, if you take and you forget about the one space and you just stick with the new space, you're going to piss some people off because they're going to be like, well, that wasn't like that here. And then you go, oh, no, that's just in this space is how this, this is how this is here. 
I've heard that conversation happen, and I've seen how that backlashes. It's not a smart move when you're doing a design. So forward thinking, not separate thinking or backwards thinking or, you know, side seat thinking or back seat thinking. You got to think about it in its entirety. What have we done? What can we do? What will we do? And how are we going to do it? So marketable products, they tend to do this more often, right? They test the limitations of a specific design and attract an audience based on the design's foundation. Some welcomed, others not, right? All with varied levels of opinion, experiences, tolerances, oftentimes with possible toxicity. Caution of and for the design itself. Keep access and availability in the proper hands. Expanding a space's range of influence properly and help maintain a productive space. One may not play in your world specifically, nor use your space exclusively, but share in a similar experience within that framework of design. That is what a shared experience is. A similarity within a defined space. Diverse, but repeated to some extent with success and varied support across many forms of application. Not one space, many spaces. That is a shared space. Not what you want, but what we collectively can and could want at any given moment within a generalized frame of foundational design. You know, I like to look at things like Minecraft as an example. Banjo plays Minecraft. He knows Minecraft. Minecraft isn't just Minecraft, right? Minecraft is more than that. It has other layers to it. It has other ways in which you can even play the game. Even though, when you look at it, you think, this is it. This is all you can do. But that isn't the case. There are other things within it you can do. There's other ways to approach it. Multiple ways. And then what happens as a designer, if you do it properly, is you can get that feedback and build it properly and then use that to help expand the space even further. Expand the space out. Don't chain it up. That's the worst thing that you can possibly do. So you have actual, suggestive, and non-intentional. Okay? Roles in the design must be clearly defined and not only within that space's design process, but to its multitude of its expanse. The social aspect of interaction within and around a space is defined not to exclude any individual of or from play, but to create and support consistency and set expectations of interaction for a wider diversity and ultimately inclusion of others into a defined space. You know, you don't want to build your thing for just you and your friends unless that's what you're doing. But if that's what you're doing, and then someone else comes in and they don't like it, you can't be upset by that. Because remember, specifically, you designed it for you and your friends. So you and your friends play it, and you have a great time. Someone else comes in and they don't like the space. You can't be upset to them because they don't like it. Or if they don't play it in that way that you and your group likes to do that. right? There's going to be some variables because remember you and your friends designed it together you've got that space going and now someone else comes in so you didn't take the time to educate the person coming in and how that space is operated nor its history you just added a person in and that can be an issue right the same thing happens when you take and again like minecraft as an example Someone builds Minecraft, right? My son did a whole report on it. So he builds it. We'll leave him nameless. He sold it anyways. So, builds it. Got a framework. Understands its expansive potential. Keeps it limited at first. Great for doing some really good product testing. Keeps it limited and slowly expands. Gary did the same thing. Dungeons and Dragons. Exclusive. Running it limited. Play events. Now we're expanding out. Now we're starting to publicize this. Now we have a company that's interested in it. 
and you can see how it starts to expand and expand and expand and then you get like the now the day and age and they say oh well fifth edition is the best selling thing and everything it's global dummy <laughs> of course it's going to have more sales look at it at a comparative aspect locally where it was only available before compare those numbers as its sales locally increased and by what percent more than other editions throughout the course of its local sales because a global is not local it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out global is global local is local <laughs> right but they have a problem with that they have a they have a tendency to forget because they're on that hype train and they just you know choo choo oh we're doing it and then they forget and, and you can't you gotta relax have a seat let's take a look at the numbers let's look at it what is it that's making this do better what isn't making this do better is this a short-lived hype is this a long duration what is it right and that same thing has to happen when you're doing design whether it's for yourself or for any other little aspect you have to be consistent with it all of it all the steps don't hop around right the social aspect of interaction within and around a space is defined not to exclude any individual love from play but to create and support consistency and set expectations of interaction for a wider diversity that isn't just with talking about it. That's literally every person participating within it, from the designers to distribution to everything. If you want to take something and move from a single individual to multiple individuals, you have to understand that process. You know, it's, it's logistics, right? You got a truck that's coming into a, a store, as an example. And now you got another truck coming into a store and then another truck coming into a store. How are you going to move all of that freight? Where are the teams in place? How many people do you need? Where is the merchandise going? Does it go to the floor? Does it go to the racks? There are things that happen. It isn't just a piece of paper, right? So ultimately, right, in conclusion, the defined space. Definition that supports accountability and instruction for varied tolerances across all the spaces. When you do that, it deters toxicity and promotes a more productive creative space. You know, like right now, as an example, Dungeons and Dragons is exclusively 5th edition. Their thought process is 5th edition. Their mentality is 5th edition. Yet, that's what everyone else has to do. You can only this and this and this, and that's the mentality. But then in the background, they're digging into previous. They're going into what's happened before and extracting. They don't want people like me in there because I know that stuff. They want somebody else that doesn't know that. Because then it's like, you know, I'm a gatekeeper or whatever. You get all these toxic terms for somebody who actually knows about the space itself. I was there. I played those modules. You know, I've looked at the space, I've expanded it, I've restricted it, I've allowed components to shift between it, I've run thousands of events for thousands of people, and now I get tossed to the curb because somebody else, a new era, is moving in. Well, that's the wrong way to do that. Because my era, where I have gamed, doesn't operate like that. You know, you don't cut the legs off the chair, right? You just have a shorter chair, right? A shorter lifespan is what happens, right? And it's proven, and here it is, and, and, and they're thinking about 6th edition already. Not a surprise. It wasn't ready when they released it. But through the entire process of developing 5th edition, I was there. Other people were there. It's not just me. It's a collective. And thought processes were had, and other people had left the scene as well. And you don't like to see that happen, especially when you have a long duration of time. Dungeons & Dragons been out for quite some time. And from its beginning, sitting on the lap of uh, my uncle when he's running games, here we are. We don't matter. Obviously. Because certain components within it, they say, well, that doesn't this, or that doesn't that. We can't do that. 
you'll lose an audience. And the audience that you're going to gain is going to have questions that now you don't have the answer to. You're missing the knowledge base that exists. And it isn't a matter of we know all and all that. We don't treat the system of the design in that format. We want there to be other stories. We want to hear about other things that happen at other tables. We want to help them have those things happen. We want to show them and give them all the options if they want it. Whatever option they want, this is what we do. If they're not doing that. They can't keep up. And the problem is because they're thinking from a solo aspect of the design. It's about them. Not about us. <laughs> and it shows. And that is specifically tied to their, their new design process that they're utilizing. It wasn't like that before. It's new. Self-detrimental. But it's new. right? Cutting edge. And it, it's causing a problem. You can't do the design like that. You know? Like Tarkov. Right? First-person shooter game. I would consider it an elite first-person shooter game. Because it's more fast-paced than just standard PvP. I would consider it more like tactical PvP. It requires skill set, not just play experience. You have to do more than just play the game. A lot more. You know, uh, I remember back in the day when we were using old systems like DOS and things like that, and we'd play Quake. Quake was a first-person shooter. absolutely loved it. Fantastic. But there was only very limited things you can do within the game set. That's fine. Right? It's foundational. And then a select amount of weapons. And it wasn't that it was that weapon and then that was all you can get in that and that's it. No, the weapons would spawn in and other people had the option, potentially, right place, right time, to be able to do it. And a lot of it was randomized, so you couldn't just memorize things besides maybe a map's location because the computer would generate things a little different. So it wasn't that all the time this one thing would be there and if you got to that space first, then now you win the thing. It wasn't like that. It wasn't designed that way. So it changed the competitive nature of that play space. It wasn't toxic. You get killed, you're like, crap, you got me, right? And you're excited and you want to get back in there. Now first-person shooter games is more like, you know, you want to hit the mute button, you know? That, that layer that's in there is... <laughs> It's pretty intense. So, it depends on the space. If that's what you want the design to be, then that's what you do, right? But it should promote the creativity within that space. You want people to think that they are doing something within that space. And it, it can't just be thought. Literally, they have to be able to do something within that space. You know, there was a game that I played... You know, and at this point, right, since computers came out, I'm sitting at a keyboard and a crappy green-only, text-only monitor until eventually, five or six years later, after public release of computer systems in the educational system, they had internet access. When the web finally public accessible came out. So you sit and you look back at that and you say... Wow, a lot's changed since that point. But going through the entirety of that and, and seeing how limited that type of access is and how now versatile that aspect is uh, to where even phones have the components that a computer can operate with. They have access to the internet. They have access to get email. They have access to the web. You can voice chat on it. I mean, if it's available for this, it now needs to be available for this. It's the universal uh, design of the thing. And it's all based around communication. Communication is the core aspect. And they're expanding it. Watches now, right? They've got glasses that's got access to the stuff which i'm sure that's going to start to uh, pose a problem but the design right so what does that all mean right define your space clearly 
and consistently. That's it. So let's take a look at the first part of design, right? So where is the space to be defined? So when you have a space, where is it to be defined? So to better design a supportive system, where becomes the first step. Moreover, the who should not be as restrictive as it has in the past. That is unless specifics are required for events, platform, or audience. Who becomes a supportive aspect later on in other aspects of the overall design, but foundationally, where takes precedence. And where being the digital or physical, private or public, or open, closed, and restricted space itself. You make the decision on where, and you can then build from that. Those are the top three selectives to start the foundation of the design itself. Digital, physical, private or public, and open, closed or restricted. And they are very specific. Digital, physical goes together. Private or public goes together. And open, closed and restricted goes together. And each of those aspects, those three components, is the foundation of the design. So, as an example, if I'm running a contingency event, I have to decide whether I'm going to do it digital or physical. Now we've had a pandemic going on, so the physical aspect kind of been answered for itself. There was no way to do the physical aspect of event hosting. It needed to be shifted to digital. We've already had that format. We've been using it since way before. No problem. Piece of cake. We move it to the digital space. But then we have to find out and answer the next phase of it. Is it going to be private or public? Because when we did physical events, it was very public. We would have people playing and we would have an audience of people watching us play. The audience would grow. Sometimes the audience would want to participate. We varied. It was about the enjoyment of the space. Or do we restrict it to private only? And we keep the events moving at a, I would consider it a more forward progressive space because a private space has less additives for the variables. The variable amount for a private space is less than if it's in a public space. Less people, less variables, right? Straightforward. And then it was either open, closed, or restricted. So is the event open? Anybody can come. Closed, which means that the, there isn't anybody that can come. We're selecting the people that can come. Or restricted, where it's like, you know, like a list. You sign up, once the list is full, first come, first serve, and, and that's the way it goes. Again, these are some of the basic components. If you want to be like a DM or a GM or just a designer, when you're writing the module or building a game, you got to figure out, these basic components before you even move on to anything else before you take your thought and move it past you need to know where this is going to be being used what is it what is the what is the foundation of this space you got no foundation you got no game you got no design it's not happening you know it's like an artist who sits in his room and draws something right because i do artwork if i sit here and draw it and it sits here on my desk and it doesn't move anywhere else it's a physical aspect but it's private and it's closed, right? It's just me. I've really limited that space now, right? And that's where this where comes in. What you're doing is you're deciding the range of capability of your design that's going to be needed and the range of the audience of the design. So again, remember, I said who is not as restrictive as it has been in the past, right? You're not going to say, oh, such and such only, right? It's not like that. I haven't ever done that. But they have had things that do that, right? You have to wear a suit and tie to go to dinner at this place. And now it's, you know, you got a foodie sitting in there with his phone and it's propped up on the thing. I'm at such and such and boy, this lobster is delicious and whatever. And they're wearing a t-shirt and some cutoff shorts. Whereas before that space was, you know, required with suit and tie. It depends on the success of the space, right? So you have to make those decisions. So expanding where, right? 
So where expands then to many aspects. So you have decided and undecided random world spaces, right? Durational play, you have module stories, locations, and then you have actual play, literal locations or literal types of places in which you are going to be playing that game. Contingency applies in this particular aspect to tabletop RPG. So defining a space in this form of forward thinking helps each new layer build on the next. Layers begin to define more as each layer is added in support of the previous and in preparation for the next. So you put a layer in, it's supporting the one or being supported by the one previous and it is now the support structure for the next layer that's going to be added. Examples, inspiration, or foundational instruction within the design builds options and opportunities to support the creative mind's imagination. Contingency system, we say the thing, what is your adventure, right? I sit down, I'm going to run an event, I say, what is your adventure? And the players, when they come to the event, they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, what would you like to do? What are your interests? Give me some stuff. We're going to brainstorm for a few moments. We're going to hit the pause. Everyone's going to be seated. Make sure they've got something to drink, a snack if necessary, something to write with, some dice because I use the physical mechanical aspect of the game, and we're ready to go. No preparation other than that. Brief conversation. I do events for uh, private a lot of times. You know, I have somebody call and say, oh, our DM's sick, we've got the group together, can you run an event for us? Or the DM's like, I'm new, I don't know what to do, can you help me? Absolutely, that's what we do. And all of that has various cost factors to it, depending on the extent of the event. I've actually come into groups that says, we're having an issue, but we don't know what the issue is. Can you come in and set in? Absolutely, we do that too. Full, full assessment of the situation. We'll find out what it is, if it's, if it's design, if it's location, if it's a, a personal issue, something within the, the uh, chemistry, I guess you could say, because uh, that happens. There is times that happen. It could be a, a, an attitude or a personality conflict. Uh, it could just be a behavioral issue. I approach it in the same way I do when I was doing management, trying to deal with 800 personnel in the structure, right? and the multitudes of compliance and operations that have to happen. You've got trucks coming in, you've got freight move, multitudes of facilities. There's tons of things happening, and you have to be able to rein it in, collect the information, and then make logical decisions, right, in the flow of the information. So a core part of the design of contingency is totality, right? Not parts. What literally is your adventure? What is required? When? How much? In what format, at what pace, in what media, textual, visual, digital, with support, without, full-on instruction, or just a guideline, or all of it. What is the tool if not a tool, right? A useless tool does not get used. A poorly built one breaks. A limited one can only do one or a few things at most. Versatile tools get used every day. They are more expansive. They are usually built with more longevity and with support should they reach their end. More tools are made or improvements on older ones. The right tool for the right job. And I do private contracting. So the physical aspect of that conversation takes a whole new meaning. Because, like, as an example... My mother was trying to take a deck apart, right? Right tool, wrong component for the tool, right? She didn't know. She had a blade inside the sawzall, but the blade that she had was not the blade to be doing that particular type of work. That blade was for doing tree branches. It was a pruning blade, not a demo blade, right? So she had a blade in there. As far as she knew, the there was nothing wrong with that situation. It should work. And it was, but boy, it was really ripping through it, right? Causing major delays, uh, hang-ups, <laughs> problems, right? I arrive, I check the situation out, I change the blade, I replace the tool. Here you are. Same tool, different blade, now try. 
oh, it's already improved. And then I say, but that particular tool is not the only tool required for that job. There's a couple others. And instead of taking several days on this, we can take about 20 minutes and have this done, of which we did. So I showed her how to use the sledgehammer and just use the weight of the tool to just tap it. And of course, it's a little too heavy for her to use, but that's fine. That's what I'm there for. And we have it apart in 20 minutes. Again, designing something, you have to be able to undesign that same thing so that you can add multiple components to it. Allow someone to take the entirety of it and utilize the parts that they need. You know, a lot of times somebody will say, well, I'm going to run this adventure module. And then you sit down there and play with them and you're like, I know I read that, but I don't remember any of this happening or any of these different people that are in here and maybe they expanded them. There's nothing that says that they can't. They didn't say they were running specifically that and that was it. They just said, we're going to play with this adventure module with the adventure module. So now that we know a bit about where we begin, we need to take a look at what it is. Like stated before, what is your adventure? What is the second component of design? So contingency system likes to take a look at design differently, right? We break the mold. That's what I do. I'm a mold breaker. I don't like to look at something and say, okay, that's the way that we did it. And that's the way that we're going to do it. I'm always looking for ways to improve upon whatever it happens to be to make it not only easier for myself, because a lot of times I'm doing multiple things. So in order to be able to do that, you need to find new ways to make those things function. So they, oh, this is great and it works fantastic. Let me take a look at it. I'm not saying that we will change anything, but we could. There may be a way to do it better. And perhaps there isn't, and we might decide upon utilizing it, going through it, whatever, that we create a new way to make this happen, right? I've utilized tools in a new way. I've designed tools because there wasn't a tool for the particular job, right? I'm putting a fence in. There wasn't a particular tool for this aspect of putting the fence in that needed to be in place. I was utilizing it. An issue occurred. And I said, well, that's stupid. I have a crappy design here. <laughs> Right idea, wrong design. So back to the drawing board we went. A few modifications. Ah, now we got it. It's going to work perfectly every time, and there's going to be 100% consistency to it. Because I found that it needed to have the ability to stand on its own more. So that I could use it, and it was like it was another set of hands for me. Because the job I was doing was free-form constructing a fence. That's thousands of feet and a wrap around with corners and there's trees and roots and everything else. So there's other physical aspects that are draining enough on the already mental requirements for leveling the cross members and putting the posts in level and down to grade and height requ uh, requirements for the city. And there's all these components and you have to do things through that layering process. You know, be that critical with it, even if you're just doing something for your friends. And, you know, and last year we went through, we did a lot of instructional videos on, like I said, you know, like mapping design and everything else. And we looked at it in different components. And the reason that I instructed in the components is because layering in the knowledge base, starting with the foundation and then adding the layers to it, is so much more rewarding to a person, whether it's I've been doing this for 30 years or I've been doing this for 30 seconds, right? I literally know nothing about it. I have no previous knowledge base. I have 30 years of knowledge base. So how does that merge together? How do you get that bridge and put that together so that all of that data can go into somebody else, right? You got to pass it along. And it's all about the process, right? Like my kids, I got two kids. And you want to explain something to them they're two kids, right? So they're going to understand things at a different level. Now, they have some genetics of me in there somewhere. So my hopes is that through genetics, 
the foundation is in there enough for me to be able to explain something in a way that they're going to understand. And it is. Great. Great for creation. <laughs> Randomosity of cells moving about, replicating. We got some good ones in there. So I give the basic instruction, and I wait. Knowing that I didn't know the entirety of the process at the beginning when I first did it. So layering on the entirety of the process is not a good idea. I am acceptant that layers are required. It's all about pacing and the right flow of information. So gradually you add layers, you let the comfort level go, that increases the confidence level, that increases the I want to do this. Fantastic. This is now your new task and, and now you can do it successfully. And success over a period of time, starts to reduce the duration of time required to do it. And then they start to develop other ways to do the job more efficiently. You've taught properly. So for us at the contingency system, right, when we take a look at something, it's theoretical framework of design. That's what contingency is. It's a theoretical framework of design. Through multitudes of testing and situations, I can't even, you know... I used to run over 13 different groups a week, okay? In 13 different worlds, thousands of players, hundreds of which were there weekly. Same consistent group of rotating players in there. Just bang, bang, bang. And I am the only person running these events. You can think for a moment, a group of people who typically runs five players. My tables were ten or more people. Rarely ever did I run less than 10 people. It just, there was no way. There was just so many people. I had to run larger groups of people. And I had to develop ways in which to do so because that particular tool set did not exist. But I was still running things like Dungeons and Dragons, events from Pathfinder, writing my own stuff, uh, freeforming it, of which they didn't know the difference, no matter what I was running. They, they could not tell the difference. They just kept coming every week, and a lot of times it was like they didn't want to stop. They wanted to keep going for another seven hours. But, you know, life, I got things I got to do too. So, but you go and you, you run these spaces and you do these events. You design all this stuff for them, and it's, you know, it's like a job, really. You know, because there's a lot of things that you do. But I took that upon myself to do that. You know, there's no compensation or anything else, I wish. That'd be great. I would love to do that continuously, you know, which I do do that. I do do that uh, now, obviously, to get paid. Uh, there are some things that I do for that. Uh, but previously, for, you know, over 10 years, it was me doing it. And then I trained up some other people because the need was just so great. The time had come for me to pass on the structure of the contingency's foundational system so that they could do some design of their own. And knowing full well the, uh, the capabilities of the system allowed me to do that because I could, I could do what was required in the right format because I knew the individuals. Right? And the idea of doing a design like what I do, theoretical framework of design, you know, to some tabletop RPGs, it, it means one thing, and to others, it means something quite differently. You know, the thought process of design dictates a definition, a specific of what. At the contingency system, like, literally, tabletop RPG stands for tangible theater, theoretical, randomized probability game. It's not just a table. It's not just a top. It's not roll, it's not playing, it's not game. It's literally tangible theater, theoretical, randomized probability game. Period. Because when you look at it, you look at all of the variables that make up the titling, tabletop RPG, which is what they used to call it. And it exists, tabletop, table talk, role playing, as in R-O-L-E, or role-playing as an R-O-L-L, -L, there are a multitude of them happening. And they can argue amongst themselves, but I don't look at it as an individual basis. I look at it as an expanse. I know there are multiple aspects of it, 
and I want all of these components to operate. And we're going to look at each of those components in due time. We might look at a few of the details within this one. Um, so I kind of wrote this presentation piece um, earlier today. And I had, you know, I got massive notebooks full of tons of data that I've been accumulating for over 30 years. My storage unit had at least 60 some massive storage boxes full of worlds and maps and stuff. I got to have over 200 worlds at this point, fully developed with tons of creatures and uh, full modules. You know, it's just ridiculous. But to someone looking at it and just hand it to them, it's going to do nothing. I need to put that into the framework of what can be passed along. So tabletop RPG, right? It's a five-part formula that can be limited to RPG, which is a three-part formula. And nearly all aspects of consistency utilize a self-designed principle that I call the 357 rule. I mentioned it before, mentioned on some other times that I'm running stuff. I utilize it in daily operations of things when I have to go in and do uh, managerial aspects like uh, assessments for facilities, things like that, or management um, is having an issue or personnel is having an issue. There's all these things that pop up, you know, could be logistics, could be personnel, could be literal leadership problems, right? I utilize the 357 rule, which is a system that I designed myself. Taking into consideration really well thought out ideas that weren't completely finished. You know, like Gygaxian 3, right? I've labeled it that. It's Gygaxian 3 because I have created that label for that. Found it, extracted it, looked at it as a development process, right, a design, and then went through everything and extracted it out. Found its path, figured out how it was utilized, extracted as an operating principle. If I was working at Wizards of the Coast, I would use Gygaxian 3 to produce products within the system consistently. It wouldn't matter who was doing it. It wouldn't matter the design. I would utilize that to make it happen. But then because it's me, I would have to do expanding it out to 5 and to 7 because I know that that actually finishes the entirety of that. Because at the time of design, Gygaxian 3 worked well. And they don't understand how far in the system that that actually pertains to the structure of the game itself. And they're tearing it down bad. That's why I don't play 5th edition. I can't. It's just, it's not... There isn't enough of it there to do with it what is required. And it doesn't make it, you know, they like to say and people, oh, and they live and breathe Dungeons and Dragons. Well, I do too, but 1st edition through 4th uh, edition is my limitation. 5th edition I can't do. It's too broken for me. It doesn't create a forward thought process. You know, it can be fixed. I know how to fix it. I know what's wrong with it. I can make the corrections. I've my dungeon master guide is so marked up with the corrections for it. I said, well, this is going to take some time to fix. Um, cool. And uh, not happy, especially through the design. But I take a more scientific, mathematical, and psychological approach to the design. Private, public, professional spaces, it doesn't matter. It's not limited to that. But it's inclusive of all of those components within the design of tabletop RPG for me. You know, in every aspect of the contingency system, I use a formulaic called table, right? Because the idea is it's going to be used in the space, right? And the table stands for theoretical framework, application, base foundation, learning methodology, and execution of design. It's a process. You go through the process, and you can build what you need for that space. No matter what, it always works without fail, whether you've prepared it ahead of time or are using it within the moment. The multitudes of thousands of different millions, possibly maybe billions, because I ran a lot of games. The combinations, no matter what, it has not failed. With me or with anyone else, it works. Period. So theoretical framework, that's what contingency is. It's a structure that can contain, support, and examine a space. It's a theory of research and study designed to explain a space in its entirety and address its many components. It's, it challenges and expands existing knowledge within previous limits of the space. 
addressing the problems of previous designs and building multitudes of new solutions beyond just those developed to rectify existing issues, inadequately expa explain pre-existing without an educational format, and self-limited designs have over time shown their limits, right? They've done things with less explanation, they have not written them in an educational format, and they have limited it to the design itself. And over time, that has shown greatly. So for over 30 years of use, contingency has taken the, a different route, right? We take an analytical, knowledge-based approach for applicable appropriateness and ease of application, explanatory diversity, and replication of consistency, all a result of the 30-year journey of this system, right? It can be done because they cannot. That's not your failure. It's theirs. So if utilizing it, you find that there's an issue, that's not your fault. A lot of times that's foundation is from the design itself. Can it be fixed? Absolutely. Can you doing it make the correction on your own? Absolutely. Might need a tool for that? I might have something for it. So the critical approach to longevity of a space, its expanse and organization is in a step-by-step -step application to go as far as required articulation in alert fashion to pass forward a foundational thinking of intellect through layers of generalization and specification that supports a varied audience, identifying limitations of generalizing and when and where specifics need to be to support those generalizations that continue, else the foundation fails. So, effects, needs, and spotlights, right? BNS. It's a variability of examination of variable components and combinations under varied circumstances. So variability of examination, variable components, and combinations of those components under the varied circumstances. Three Vs, right? Relationship of all those components within that space, we call that ENS. Effects, needs, and spotlights. What is it? So the knowledge and understanding of your own design before you can pass that design on to others will absolutely show the design in a more forward-thinking, informing, and effective manner that supports critical thinking and application, right? You're playing a tabletop RPG. You're playing any game that requires the player to make decisions, and then those decisions have an effect on either their own progression or the progression within the space of the world, whatever it is that they're they're doing. So on Minecraft, if you just ran around and did nothing, your character eventually isn't going to make it. Got to punch some trees, right? You're playing Ark. You got to get some resources. You need some clothing. You need some structures. You need some food. You have needs. Survival, right? going to tame some dinos. On Minecraft, you're going to build some houses, build some structures, you're going for resources or specific resources that increase your ability to be successful. They're not all required for you to be successful, but they increase your success range. Same thing with the tabletop RPG. Every encounter that you go through increases your success for the overall adventure. Fail an encounter, your success for the overall adventure goes down. It doesn't immediately end. It goes down, right? And that all becomes with the next part of it, which is develop, assess, and ready or redesign. We call that dark, right? So designating data into a format that can influence properly a thought process that supports an infinitely imaginative space is absolutely possible. You develop it, you assess it, you ready it for production, or you take it and you redesign it. It's that simple. The system is constantly self-checking itself. Gygaxian 3 operates like that. Gary built it to self-check the system. If a module isn't right, Gygaxian 3 can fix it. It knows exactly what to do to make the correction. They don't know it exists, and so they're not using it because he, he 
didn't get the chance or didn't want to explain how that process works to the to the personnel within the building, right? Whoever they have on their team. So, problem solution mentality. Ah. Uh, Problem solution mentality is is in in the thought process of design in general. It's crucial. In leadership, even more crucial, right? If you are creating problems and not creating solutions, or you don't have a solution to a problem and you don't know the steps in which to get there, you're not going to be effective, right? And it's not about avoidance. But it's about accountability and leadership by the design itself. So awareness that it isn't just one space, but a collection of spaces should not take an industry years to decide or find. They have been there for over 30 years. It is more than one space. Clearly, it's a shared experience, right? Remember, they say it all the time, shared experience, shared experience. But they don't live by that rule set when they're designing it. Shared experience. And like, well, this is our module. You look at it and you go, okay, cool. So well, they can only do these things because with the rest of this, from this design, they don't do this, then none of this will help. So I guess I got to put the conductor in. Because even if I change this, now I have to now change this. And then because that's changed, I have to change this. Because again, it's that track, right? So where and what we both both of those components we touched on briefly but why you must ask right or you might ask should solution be part of the design because when you ask a question shouldn't it have an answer right should a problem not have a solution why do you think more problems arise or continue in designs they're not part of the design so you have to design differently you have to design a solution. You can't design a problem. It's ridiculous. Now, hackers, they design problems. But the problems that they're designing have a solution. Just they know the solution already. They're designing the problem to create a solution. <laughs> That's a hacker, <laughs> right? That's what they do. So when you're designing a game, you should be designing a solution. You don't want to be using a mold that's broken, cracked, repaired. Sometimes you have to make a new mold. Sometimes you have to take a look at the mold and say, okay, this is a great mold, but it doesn't have longevity. We need to fix this so that this can be done. Perhaps its components need to be different. Maybe instead of making the mold out of clay, we need to make it out of titanium. So it is machined precise. It can happen, right? So, why break the mold? Theoretical and applied disciplines require more from design. They rebuild and dismantle all in the same. Forwards, backwards, upside down, left, right, sideways, up, inside out. I say it all the time. I use that phrase in every aspect of anything that I'm doing that is instructional based. Forwards, backwards, upside down, left, right, sideways, up, inside out. In every space. We live in a three-dimensional space, maybe more dimensions than that. So you have to be able to look at things from all angles of it in order for it to be successful. And a lot of times you become hyper-focused and you, you are looking at it from a specific angle and you don't take the time to get up move around and look at it from a different perspective and that is crucial you have to do that there's no way not to do that you know i call it half-assing it and that's literally what it is half-assing it is like you know well, i'll lean take a look but i don't want to get up right that's what half ass is i'm just going to lean take a look at it from this angle and that's about it no get get up move the chair I, you know i i had a, a team of management they they 
were setters. That's what they were. Setters and PA users. Get on the mic and they'd call and direct from their seat. So I went in there and dethroned them all. Took all the chairs and got rid of them. Dismantled them completely. So they understood the concept if by happenstance they found the chairs, they would have to take the time to put them together. And if it was heard that someone was doing it, because the rest of the entirety of the store was instructed, do not under any circumstance put those chairs back together. If they want a chair, they're going to put one together themselves. On their own. Really good at delegating tasks, but they don't do any on their own. None. Leadership, one of them. No chairs? Boy, were they upset. But, you know, there's a lot more happening. And what a reduction in problems it was when they had to move around. They're like, well, that isn't what I said to do. No, it isn't. But you wouldn't know because you never came and checked. So... You don't know, right? You gotta look. Every angle. And when you've exhausted all of the angles, have somebody else look at it. Right? And that's usually when they call me. They're like, we don't know what's happening. Can you take a look? Absolutely. I can do it digitally or I can do it physically, right? Because you have to be able to do that. So the entirety of the space without bounds within it and around it. Utilize every means. And if it still yet does not, then develop new ways to look at the space, new resolutions. Solve what cannot be solved by previous means. That requires a total engagement and recognition of the space. And I find that that helps improve the design so much just by taking a total look at the entirety of the space and recognizing exactly how much of this exists. Why is where important? Why is what important? Because they both create the space with every which every other component resides. Without the space, there is no space. Why is the final factor of foundational design? So you know where and you know what but you also need to know why, right? From this, you can build anything for who, when, and decide how, really. That space begins to evolve from an idea into a tool of design. But you need a foundation, right? Got to have that foundation. So let's take a look at the space. So what is the space? As the design goes, there's quite a range. Contingency approaches the space like any other aspect of design, and that is always in detail. Inquisitive detail, right? The space is a fictional, simulated, or blended space across, within, or including a setting, world, or worlds, and events that can be focused upon individual, multiple, or supportive casts of interactive components within a guided, structured, or supportive space. That's what our definition, my definition of the space is. That's how I look at a tabletop RPG. Fictional simulated blended, across within including, setting world and events, individual multiple supportive, guided structured support. That's it. It can be for solo, Multi multiplayer or collaborative players. Solo meaning success is focused on the individual. Multiplayer meaning success is focused on a collective of individualized choices. Or collaborative meaning that multiple required successes within the interactive components of choice are required. Right? Games use these a lot. 100%. They don't all use them in that particular definition. And a lot of them have issues when they do that. Oh, the PvP space is toxic. I say it myself. It absolutely is because they forgot what solo, multiplayer, and collaborative gameplay is. Because they're only using two components instead of the three. 
But there absolutely is three components to gameplay. Always. Never without. You have to make a decision on how you're going to do it. So, tabletop or table talk, right? When you're thinking about tabletop RPG, is it really tabletop RPG or is it table talk RPG? And you have to make those decisions, right? A lot of times people watching these uh, role-playing games, right? Critical Role is an example. They're like, oh, they're playing a role-playing game. Yeah, they are. And it's heavy roll, R-O-L-E, not R-O-L-L. And it's more talk than talk. But yeah, TTRPG, they got. So, tabletop role-playing game, R-O-L-E, as an emphasis on roles, characters, and interactives between the two. Tabletop role-playing game, R-O-L-L, is a mechanically driven game that focuses on the interactives and variability of the space itself. Table talk role-playing game is heavy character, low mechanic, character developing space. Table talk role-playing game, R-O-L-L, this time is focused on the interactives and variability-driven space, but emphasizes on the dialogue and the expanse of those spaces, right? So if I was to classify Critical Role, I would say Critical Role is Table Talk, R-O-L-E, playing game. Heavy character, low mechanic, character developing, emphasis on the roles, the characters, and the interactives. 100%. It's not mechanically driven, Interactives and variability. It's not interactives and variability driven and emphasized on the dialogue itself, right? They are running heavy character, heavy talk. They are actors. That's what they do. That's their space. And that dial between these just four variables within the single variable, tabletop or table talk, right? You make the decision on that because each of those then break down to their own components. So tabletop and table talk break down into role and role, right? R-O-L-E and R-O-L-L. Because there are those two aspects. You even got LARP, right? Which is live action role playing games. Which is even more emphasis specifically on the person into a more physical aspect, not just a verbal one. It's even now physical added to the aspect. And that happens a lot with those game spaces too. Critical Role is now also based on that role of those characters because they're utilizing voices. So it's live action, I would say. They're utilizing the voices of their characters. They put themselves into their character literally. They're, they're utilizing that. And they feed off of that. And that they're in and that is their role. That's what they're doing. That's why it's called Critical Role, right? So... Storytelling, right? What is occurring and unfolding? Participating. Who and whom? What part of the story? An audience. Entertainment value and the return. These components go together. Storytelling, participating, and audience. So how is that happening? And it moves into the next specific, not forgetting that it exists, to open narrative freeform, which is the narrative driving the story, Constructive narrative, which is the story drives the story, which it's a specified narrative or it's a limited narrative. Or you have structured, which is a guided, guided and open narrative, which the story promotes a narrative, supportive and impactive structure. The players are free to make decisions on their own vocals. Whatever they decide to say, it impacts the game in variable ways. Constructive narrative would be like an adventure module, right? An adventure module has a story driving the story, right? It's specified, the narrative's within it, and it's very limited. And it's doing that. It doesn't really put in, unless you get a really good module, alternatives to that narrative. The narrative is pretty well being wrote out like a book. So you have unscripted narrative, which is... Sequenced, limited, or open, right? You're going to make the decision. 
is it sequence, let's say, turn-based, or they can only do so many things within their, their um, turn. Limited, open, right? All these different things. We've seen it before, right? You've got the uh, the funny thing like Jumanji, where it's like, welcome to Jumanji, right? An NPC character can only say certain things, right? He's the menu N NPC, and you can only select from those four things or three things, and that's it. You know, Skyrim's got that. You got the four options, and then and then there you go. But you might have that where that goes into uh, the next piece, where that affects the world space. Now, whatever the option is, that component now trickles through the whole rest of the existence of the space. That's kind of how contingency works. This decision now replaces the other options for decisions. And the entire rest of the space has now accumulated that decision into its uh, decision making, right? So then you have a scripted narrative, right? Sequence, specific, and designed. And each one of these are just layering it in, right? So you have storytelling, participating audience, then it goes down to open narrative, constructive narrative, structured narrative. Now it's unscripted, scripted, and actor-driven, right? So scripted narrative is sequenced, right? Similar to unscripted. It can be specific, and it can be designed, right? So you can literally put it in. So like in an adventure module, it says so-and-so says one of these three things. That's scripted. It's also a constructed narrative. So it's a constructed narrative where the story is being driven by the story's decisions, right? Very specified and limited. And a scripted narrative is, is also, it's sequenced. It's specific and it's designed purposefully to then, you're right, because your specific is, is never forgetting its foundational aspect, which is the constructed narrative. So scripted narrative is not forgetting the constructed narrative which is not forgetting the storytelling aspect, right? So as you specify the components out, as they're expanding, and you're re-narrowing them back to the final design, it's not forgetting where it began. It's helping that design take shape. And how it takes shape is based off of all those decisions, right? So then you have actor drip, which is unsequenced, whim or self-developed, right? Critical role is very much that, you know, and, and whether or not they rehearse it before they do it or they cut, I never do cuts. I don't do cuts on my streams when I live stream. I don't do cuts um, when I'm doing videos or instructions if I'm playing a game. I, I do it as it is. If I do events, it's straight through. I don't take a break. I just do the event. It takes as long as it happens to take, right? Some people do edits. They need edits. It makes them feel better. They do edits. YouTube videos, they do a lot of edits. I can see where they edit, where there's cutscenes. Sometimes they don't cut where it's not noticeable, right? There's a major cut there and you see it. No, movies sometimes may not do scene transitions properly. It just kind of depends. So you got the decision parameters, right? Character restricted or randomized. So your decision parameters within the space is it character driven? Is it restricted? Or is it randomized? Right? Are you relying on the characters making a decision to move forward? Are there already parameters in place to move forward? Or do you have to do something to randomize that to move the story forward? Those are the different components. So plot emphasis foundation. So you've got the world, you've got the characters, and you've got the events within that world. Events may be just world-based, they may involve the characters, and maybe both. So the plot emphasis for the world, right, is lore, longevity, and survivability. That's how the world itself looks at the decision-making process. It's either a component of previous decisions, it's a component of to-be decisions, right, things that are going to happen, or it's the now, survivability aspect. Right now this decision is being made, and it changes what happens in the future. So you've got your characters, right? Themselves. It's their plot emphasis focused on them. Their impact, the things that they do, and how that impacts the space. And their goals and their development, right? So how is their character specifically being impacted? What's happening to them? And their concern is specifically that. It's all about them. There are spaces in which that happens to be the thing. And it, you have to be careful on how that dial operates. You may want it to be like that. Solo player games, absolutely it should be about the character. 
and then about the space around them. So then it falls back to world, right? That's why world is there first. So then you have the events, which include both the characters in the world. These are in order as they are stacked. So world would be first, then character, and then the events that happened, either within the world or the character. Because world events can affect the characters, and character events can affect the world, right? So the events uh, themselves, you get success and fail. You've got durational events, right? Maybe a short time, maybe something that happened over a span of time. Maybe there's only a certain time to have this event be remedied. And then you have the event's conclusion, right? All of those are the components of that core for that aspect of it. So you also have the social interaction, physical interactions, and self-narrative choice of the characters, participants, and hosts in the space or around it. And each of those are within the sequence. You can see they're grouped in groups of three because each of them stack potentially, right? And they move on to the next. And that's how it's always in the design. So you have your events, you have the resolution, and you have the passing of time. So you have the events, they're occurring, the event is done, and there has been a passing of time, whatever that span happens to be for that event. You have in-game time, you have real-world time, and you have a combination of the two. These things apply within the space. This is how contingency looks at it, it's how I look at it. This is how to build it properly, right? So you have the plot emphasis, right? Plot only. You have character emphasis, character only, and you have social emphasis. Everybody there is just there to talk and chill and have a good time. Doesn't matter about the character, doesn't matter about the plot, we're just here to chit-chat. and We're just using it as a means to get together. All of those aspects all apply to tabletop RPGs. All apply to RPGs. Apply to, really, human interaction in general, right? It could be about what's happening, it could be about the person specifically, or it could just be about all the people within the space. Multitudes of application. So you have the space, you have the world, and you have the motivation within the space and the world. Right? Things that wrap everything together. Written and unwritten, and you have the triggered, guided, and random. Those all work together in combination. So the system, right? So the system has a variety of rules. It's a combination of spaces, right? Or you can have a brand or imagination-inspired space, which is a single space. Or you can have a self-constructed space, which is self-driven, decided, or it's developing. It could be multitudes, it could be individualized, it's got a lot of things going for it. Variety rule spaces, systems that use a variety of rules in the same space, contingency system, I can use all games, the same table, same time. I have the capability to do that. I can do a combination of spaces, of which I have done often. Because I have some players like, well, I really like my character for Pathfinder. I like my character for Green Ronin. And I like my character for Dungeons & Dragons. And everybody plays at the same table, and nobody knows any different. I'm the only one. I have the capability to run all of those at the same table at the same time using their individualized rule sets by combining the likenesses within the brands and eliminating the flavor for them, applying the flavor specifically as a mechanic then to that character when they're taking their turn. No one knows the difference. Only I do. Everybody thinks they're playing in the same system. They have no idea. No idea whatsoever. So a branded space, like I only play this, I only play Dungeons and Dragons, or I only play Pathfinder, is usually imagination inspired. So it goes together. Specific brand, you're in it so much, it's going to start to create things just by the volume of duration. And it becomes a single space. So no matter what you know, like what brand you're using, what book it is that you're using within that space, you start to collectively utilize the space because you've been in it for such a duration of time. Self-constructed spaces, which I do that often. You know, I'll get calls from somebody saying, hey, can you design a world for us? We want to play a group. Or can you write this module? Self-constructed spaces are self-driven, 100%. You're going to decide the length, duration, all that stuff, all those factors. You're going to make the decisions on it. And if not, you're going to have it as developing space. That means that it's going to continue to grow as you do. It's not limited by publication like a branded space is. And it's not limited by uh, the variety of context that a variety space might be using because there's so many different options within a variety space 
I wouldn't consider it developed. I would consider a, a, a combination space active. Active being there's always going to be content of some kind ready for the take. Where a self-constructed one requires some development, right? So flexible levels, right? You have flexible levels of realism, challenge, and success fail or a consequence variable. Right, you're always going to have that. You got reward thresholds, which is either monetized situation or or scaled. Monetized being that it's already decided, you know, and it's it's just you find this when you find trolls, you find this when you find goblins, right? Situational is well, you find this goblin, but he's got this whole horde of stuff that he had from here, right? Or maybe goblins, you know, are are. Uh, being oppressed and and now you know you don't want to take his stuff and and it stays with him and you want to help him get it back to the bank so he can put it in so he doesn't have to live in the woods anymore whatever the case may be scaled means that it's in comparison to where the characters happen to be at the duration of time and position within the space so a 30th level character is going to get appropriately leveled reward a first level character is going to get appropriate level reward, right? It's one of the falls of arc sometimes. It has the different colored arc drops that occur. Again, they don't tend to progress as the character progresses. So a lot of times you'll still find gear that doesn't match what level your character happens to be at that time. You know... It's not taking into account, the AI isn't taking into account the randomosity that's appropriate to the character. It's just doing randomosity based off of what it does. So, again, with a reward threshold, you want to take a look at things like the statistical mechanics within the game, the randomosity of how that applies, and how it is regulated by the world space in general. So you don't want to be dropping, you know... Uh, Thor hammers all over the place, and everybody's got a Thor hammer, right? There should be one Thor hammer, right? Maybe two. And you got to have that thought process so that you don't break the only space that you've created. You want to make sure that your space can continue to grow. So, advancements again, further looking at it, you have physical, semi physical, and mental uh, advancements within the space. Wealth, treasure, and gear, which also have reward thresholds upon them. And reward thresholds are uh, guidelines, potential caps, or limitations within it, right? Uh, and it may just be durational also. You know, like you can only use this really super cool thing three times and you have to wait and then you can use it again or maybe that's all you can do, right? So then you have the world effects on the advancements. How does advancing affect the world space itself? events within the world space, and the character's renown, which is past, present, and future effects, right? you got to look at the entirety of it. So in open development, when you do open development for a space, you take a look at the story, the personal aspect of it, the story aspect, the personal aspect, and the world aspect. And you have to take a look at all of them. You can't just look at one or the other. All of those components must be looked at when you're in open development of a space, right? In closed development, you're going to take a closer look at story location and the personal limited focuses within that space. You already know what the world is. You've developed foundational stories. You've developed the capability for personalities to be within that world. Now you need to start individualizing that a bit. And then you also have the sense-fed open world, right? And sense-fed open worlds are things that are not discovered, the known and unknown aspects of the world space, and the impact on all sides of that entire thing, which basically trickles into the outcomes. So you have determined, which is in intended actions or interpreted actions, right? So like a dungeon master says, the challenge rating for this is 18 or whatever. And it's like they're only utilizing the dice range of the stuff. Right? But there's other numbers, and obviously the characters advance. So then what that tends to do, 5th edition does this horribly, is undermine the character's advancement. 
of which they in the game then purposefully undermine the character's advancement. You can only make these choices and you can only gain these things and you're capped out at 20 for your stats now. Okay, well, I have no interest in that. Because once I get to that, then what's the point? Art kind of does that too when I play it. Maximum level is 105. So what I do is I get to level 105 and then I continue to play the game afterwards as if I'm a character surviving in the game. I don't get any more a level advancement, so to speak. I don't even use that, that aspect of the game. And I continue to play the game and I use the survivability aspect of food, water, and actual deaths to determine my um, play experience itself. Uh, I like playing Elite Dangerous. Elite Dangerous is similar to that. You know, you blow up your ship. You could say, well, the ship's gone. I'm not going to have them replace. You know, I'm not allied with these guys. They wouldn't replace my ship for me. You can make a, an underlying story within the framework because it was built open-ended like that. So you have to kind of figure that out. So then you have uh, the player character uh, impacted, right? Is it direct? Is it not direct? You know, you have to figure out how much of the space does the character and the players have control over? And you have to be incredibly careful with that when you're doing tabletop RPGs because what can happen is the immersion factor and the, the challenge of the space, the threat of the space, can be reduced to nothing. And when you have no threat of failure within the space, there's no challenge attached to the space, it's whatever I want, right? Brand new car, right? I say that a lot when we're doing events with, with players like that. Here, you want a brand new car, and you know, whatever. It gets old because it's not any fun, right? There's no challenge to the space. If we're just sitting here talking about it, then what do we need the dice, right? We don't need the dice now. So now we're doing uh, table talk, right? Completely. It's table talk. Are we doing a role-playing game or are we doing a role-playing game, right? Well, we're doing R-O-L-E because we don't need the dice anymore. R-O-L-L, -L, out the window. So now the space has been redefined and, and it may not be fun for someone else. So the define, right? You want to define it. Success, fail, the world itself, the storytelling aspect, all of those things can be based off of the outcomes in the story. So not only do they set up the space, but they also determine where the space is leading to. Right? So it's a management of components. That's what it breaks it down to. You know, It's crucial to manage the components and their effects. They're therapeutic at times, you know, there's a development behind it. It could be behavioral, social, problem solving, language, learning and instruction, mathematical, situational response and readiness and application, process of speed and recognition. All of these things apply from the gaming space to the real world space, right? So the effects of the gaming space have transitioned, whether it's digital or physical, doesn't make any difference. It has a takeaway, and takeaway involves a lot of these components, right? It can be therapeutic, right? It can create uh, solutions to developmental issues for, for people that have developmental problems. Could be social, could be not. Could be behavioral, right? They're all on the list. Problem-solving uh, issues, they can't, they get a situation and then they panic because they don't know what to do and they have all that. Well, it's in, a, in that setting, it allows them to be able to do that without the, the threat of actual time weighing on them and the response being that critical you got to give them the time to do that you know especially when you're dealing with someone who who you know obviously is having that problem or if you have an, an, an understanding by playing with them in that space some people take longer to take their turns and there may be a reason for that and after time properly done you can improve that I actually had people in the medical field approach when I was running events and ran a lot of events to help individuals through a lot of these aspects uh, to do these things, to help their situational response time, their situational readiness. You know, there are things that happened and they didn't know what to do. They didn't have the tools for that. They weren't, you know, possibly raised in the proper household or they just didn't have the mental capacity because of, of an illness of some kind. There's nothing wrong with that. You can assist, you know. We, we had people that had uh, Down syndrome, and, and people thought, you know, well, they can't do this, it's too complicated. Absolutely not. I disagree. There are levels within it that can be applied to allow participation of any, any person, it doesn't matter, any person of any capability. 
do they have a want? Then they have a place. If they're toxic, then I have no place for them. That's where I draw the line. My tolerance level for toxicity is, I'll see you later. It's not forward thinking. Accountability, right? I consider it more like the bullying mentality. But you want to make sure that that space is properly being maintained. And sometimes somebody might not have the capability to do something about that. But you're in a position to do something about that. That's what you do. So you create the proper space. And if a situation arises, then you have to take care of that. And it may be direct, it may be not. And I've told people to push their chair. I've had it happen. The rest of the table is quiet. They know. And it may leave a gut and, you know, feeling in there. You know, like they got a, a lead weight in their stomach for a moment. I may take the person to the side. It all depends on the response requirement for the situation. If the person is being socially visible with it, then I'll address it socially visible because they're getting an enjoyment of doing that and creating that um, level of tension within the table then I have no problem being the person to walk up and break that tension 100%. There's no reason to have to run like that. You don't have to do that. You can absolutely remedy the situation. You know, and it, like the new age is bringing the mentality right now of safety, 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 safety. Oh, I must be safe. But these people end up being the most toxic people that you ever imagined and, and, and will say things that would make, you know, they like to say that the comment, you know, like a sailor's mother, but, you know, all sailors, obviously, right, you know, don't say things in a manner that would do that, right? You know, there are some sailors that, you know, you would just think, wow, this person's fantastic, right? There's other ones where you're like, wow, this person's got some extra words in there. I can get very vocalized when I'm doing things, and there's nothing wrong with it. But that doesn't mean that my limitations are to that only. No. I can talk in a business professional manner if necessary. It just depends on the situation. If it's my space, and I'm in the space, then I can do what I want. If it's a shared space, then I have to think about the, sh the, the aspect of other individuals within the space. And the same thing applies when you're creating the table. Like I do, um, when I do my events, before I let the event occur, I have a, a screening process. Kind of like a job interview, I guess you could say. But I don't just like anybody walk in. Now, we did have open game days, and I prepared myself for open game days, and the players at the space, we have a, a conversation before we sit down, and everyone still has to go through the process of being screened through what I consider being an interactive agreement. To be in this space, you agree to operate in this fashion. Failure to do so... There are varying requirements and varying circumstances and varying levels of accountability. So depending on thus, a response is made. But there's no duration. It happens immediately. So there's no second chance and all this other stuff. I've had players set in time out because they felt that, okay, I think I can do this. And the rest of the table is like, okay, we can give them another chance. But they're going to have to set down for a bit because we're upset. Absolutely, I agree. And they have a little set down, and they wait because we're all adults here or even children. And I've run events with kids from age 6 all the way up to over 80 years old at the same table. And when people are at the table, I've never had an issue unless there was a person that was an issue. So the person that was an issue was dressed in over the thousands of events it's only happened maybe a handful of times where a person has misunderstood the requirements of that social interaction. And then you got to address it. So the design is more than just a design, right? It's components, where, what, why. Develop the space and the foundations for who as a whole. This is a peek into the tabletop RPG from the, the perspective of design within the contingency system. And I and, you know, anyone else that's utilizing the contingency system. Hope you find it informative and find some component of it for use in your personal spaces. And there'll be more about contingency as a topic in general later on. And within contingency and with contingency will be 
even more in upcoming videos uh, and more works besides that very soon. Um, I'm working on currently uh, what I would consider an introductory book uh, for the system itself. It's going to have what I would say is the quick play system in its foundation. And the reason that I'm going to release that book first is because I like to start with a framework. And cost factors, not sure what the cost factor for that's going to be. Uh, but in it, I included a lot of the things that I do and use when I do private instruction for a tabletop RPG, or if I'm doing like, uh, if I get a call and say, hey, you know, we're designing this, can you take a look at it? What do you think? And I take a look at it and see, and see what's up. And the, the cost varies depending on what it is. You know, like an editor gets paid to edit things. I'm more than an editor, right? I'm, I'm more because I take a look at the developmental acts, uh, aspect of it as well as the instructional aspect of it. And then, yes, I will look at the flow of it, uh, the typography of it. You know, you want to take a look at it if you're missing punctuations or words mistakenly put or something like that. But words in general don't have to be super extensive or confusing to be able to communicate something. Uh, you can use big words. It's okay to do that. I used some words on here that I would consider big words. Um, but the words are supported. And the nice part about doing that is then now you've expanded somebody else's space a bit. It gives them the chance to say, oh, well, I know what that means now and how that applies to that particular thing. And I think the takeaway for that's pretty nice. So we're at the end. So thanks as always. Happy gaming, right? Uh, links can be found in the channel descriptions. So here on Twitch, uh, YouTube's linked, Twitter's linked. I'm pretty sure I got the email link on there. Uh, PayPal is on there if people want to make donations. The channel's got, you can subscribe, you know, like, comment, all that kind of stuff. Um, all the videos um, from Twitch, when they reach their end and Twitch is done with them, um, I then move them over to the YouTube space. So they're found here first. Um, they're live. Chat is open. People can comment, do whatever. Um, these presentations, when I do these, um, they are semi-structured. I have the information in front of me. A lot of times I can do these like I did the entire last year's season without putting anything on the visuals. But the idea of utilizing the space a little different um, opened up a couple of uh, thought processes with allowing the pause and take a look at and allow people to reread without having to play through the whole thing. Um, they could screenshot stuff. Again, you know, everything within the channel, um, it's always personal use. If somebody wished to use something in a more professional means and say, oh, no, it's just inspiration. No, 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 no. No, this exists here. This is where this exists. So if they want to use it, uh, that's what the other contact meets are for. They, you know, they can do so, and it is open for contracted agreement for that space. Um, I have, I have a project that I'm working on. It's a little, a little something different. Normally, I don't do projects like that, but the project I'm working on, I won't show it on this particular video. I'll do it uh, the next time that we do a tabletop RPG stream, but. Um, the, the content within it, uh, I think, has uh, applicable use within this particular part. So I'm probably going to make a, not really a slide. I think this worked a lot better. Uh, I'm, I'm happier with this. The slides weren't effective. I didn't think they were effective. So I'll put it into a format and probably get it on here. Um, I've also got... Uh, Elite Dangerous is now on the PC, and I've got through most of that. So the gaming aspect of the channel will start to expand past ARC. We'll just say that. So we've been focused on ARC. 
Uh, before, when I was streaming from the PlayStation, we were focused on some of the other games that I had, too. But we're going to try to get that connected through the PC. Uh, because it works a little bit better in this space, I think. it's uh, For me, I think it's more, I guess, presentation capable. So that you can kind of do more with it, I guess. I can pause and don't have to go, oh, what was I talking about? I forgot, you know. So I'm going to try to get that moved over to here, and then I can always I can do that. You know, because the PlayStation has kind of evolved into a, a family space so that everyone is kind of utilizing the same unit because our other uh, unit is non-functional. It's uh, the black screen of death. I think, you know, the power surge we had the last time when we were utilizing it, I think that nerfed it. It was done. I can get it to power into the screen, but only in safe mode, and I can't get it back out. So I think it's just done. But I didn't get rid of it, and I still have it. I'm sure something will occur that will allow me to get what's on it back off. But the gameplay progress on there is on there. It's just, it's there, so... But again, yeah, thanks everyone for uh, watching. If everybody's cool or whatever, if you got any questions, now's the time to ask it. If not, then uh, I will see you in the next one. So I'll zoom over here. So I'll chit chat while I give you guys a moment to figure out if you got any questions or not. Um, Worlds, Encounters, Adventures, Campaigns, Quests, NPC Building, Monsters, Story Development, Mapping Process, and Creative Writing. The uh, multitude of components within the contingency system. So probably we'll finish the next stream that I do for this. We'll finish the rest of the uh, notes that I have in here that I want to cover in this uh, particular aspect of tabletop RPG design. So we got the, the core three. Right, we've moved past that. We've got some of the foundational thought for the structure on how we extract information and how we utilize information when we develop things at contingency, right? Because that's what it is. So when we do it through the system, we can plug things into the system and fix them, extract them. We can utilize the same process to figure it out. Now, watching the video here and looking at it is not the same thing as literally using it because the components within it are extremely vast and they could be utilized in all different aspects of operation. It doesn't matter what it is. I'm writing a book, we can plug it in. I'm building a game, plug it in. I have a game, plug it in. Got an RPG module, plug it in, right? It, it works no matter what. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what system it's in, doesn't matter what the mechanics are of the system. It immediately reallocates everything within it, but it kind of requires me right now uh, because the aspects exist here and inside my digital formats that I have. Uh, most of my physical formats that I've had extensive. Uh, I'm converting all of them over to digital ones, backing them up obviously, uh, but duration of use has been so far, I mean, it's, if somebody utilizes it, I know they because I know my words and I know my operations. So, and I've seen things from my videos make way into other people's videos. And that's great. And I'm glad they're inspired by it. It's in their personal space, but their personal space, I would consider also a business space. So there's a fine line. Again, my talents. So, but I watch them. So it's nice to hear my words come out of somebody else's mouth every once in a while. To an extent. So, no questions. Then I think we'll end it there. And we may be doing a stream later today. Uh, but that will be a stream based on GameStop. So, it's cooler now. It's not so hot. But basically, for like the last two weeks, felt like we were living on a volcano. And the lava was flowing next to my window. That's what it felt like. And when I stepped outside, it felt like I was jumping into the volcano. And then I had to swim through it to get to work. That's the extensive heat that we have. Now, that's not global warming. Right? It isn't, because that's not how I address things. That's just 
humidity and moisture content. So I know how biomes work and the rotation of Earth as it is tilting on its axis even more. She's got a heck of a wobble and she's we will wobble in a heck of a lot. I anticipate continental shifting happening probably within some time frame if they haven't recognized it doing so already. So, uh, appreciate everybody watching. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Again, the video stays on Twitch for, I think, 14 days is the limitation, and then uh, I move it over to YouTube after that. So, appreciate it. See you next time.